In this video I'm going to talk about editing in DaVinci Resolve, how I'm structuring my scenes from Kino City and how I'm logging the interviews. But also this video is shot on uh, Blackmagic uh, Pocket Cinema 4K, so uh, just looks pretty clean, right? 1250 ISO, ProRes HQ, and this is also the internal mics, which sounds pretty awesome. But now let's just start the show. Okay, what's up? So I'm gonna go through a whole scene again in Kino. This is what it looks like pretty much in the editing software that I use, which is DaVinci Resolve. So if you're new to DaVinci Resolve or if you're in Premiere, the editing is pretty much similar. It's not that big of a deal. It's uh, based on, I would say, what DaVinci Resolve has done is take the best, in my opinion, from Final Cut and Premiere and they've put it together into an editing system. Yeah. And in the beginning, DaVinci Resolve was just a coloring tool, so that's why it's so damn good at that and nobody can compete with it, because that's what it did really well. But now I feel like it's the same with, with this as well. Yeah. So let me just see if I can hear anything. I can hear, but you cannot. So let me change this so you can hear what I'm saying. Uh, let's see which is the audio. Here we go. Audio. DaVinci Resolve. Now you should hear. Now we've created our own geological era. Right? Okay. So when you start working on a scene, it's it's like super daunting, right? Because you really need to like go through the material and you need to look through everything uh, before you kind of start. The first step is pretty much to like log everything and I did a video on that earlier. Uh, and then once you do that, you need to sync everything. Uh, and then you need to log once more to kind of structure things into like detailed uh, keywording and, and all that. And usually like I don't, work this early with stuff so now it's a bit of like trying to get things to to be uh, in the middle of like process of shooting things and i'm still trying to do this editing live so some things i just take like shortcuts with but i wouldn't do that uh, otherwise uh, because then it's just like double work but now i've for instance taken a shortcut where i know that some of these clips which is like just the alternative shots that we're probably not going to use some of those aren't like perfect in sync but it doesn't matter because i don't think i'll use them so i'll sync them one by one uh, but the process is to sync everything up and just put it out on like a big timeline and even though we don't have any footage as you can see of all this audio here because this is the lab uh, oops let me show you uh, and even though we don't have any audio on this part here uh, or we have audio but not video you still need to listen through everything and, and kind of log everything because he's saying really valuable stuff here um, but then on other parts like these clips that i uh, talked about but i didn't show are uh, clips that i'm not thinking that i'll use so i won't sync them but usually i would sync them uh, now all the other stuff is synced and I did that pretty quickly. Uh, now one issue that I had uh, before um, was that all the clips uh, was like the clips of the video, both cameras are time coded. So they are like easy to sync just by time code, but somehow the electrosonics recorder did not sync to it. Uh, and I know what the reason is now, but I didn't know when I shot this. So when you use the electrosonics, I don't have them here, but it's really important that you don't use them and turn them off or, or something like that if you're trying to have it locked via timecode. And unfortunately, I didn't understand that. So I shot everything and thought I had everything timecoded, but then now I had to do it manually. Uh, but the good thing is that I just set the recorders and I let them be, so it's just two syncing points, and that's pretty simple. It would be a different thing if you go like on and off uh, on a recorder and you have to sync everything. But for this, it was just, this is one part, or let me show you, this part here, this is one part, 
that I need to sync and then all of this is another part so what I did was just to like sync all the the video up uh, and the way I did that was to use the the internal syncing which is pretty much you go into the media pool you would go into for instance this uh, or let's go into another one you would select like all of these all the video files and what I did was because it's two cameras I selected uh, to create a multicam clip and when you do that you can select to angle sync them by timecode you could do it as uh, waveforms or like in and out sound would be waveforms or markers as well but I go by timecode as much as I can but now I couldn't do that with the audio so I synced the, the video first and that was just like automated okay fixed uh, and this is just a workaround that I'm trying to show you so once that was done I went into this file over here let me see this is the multicam uh -huh. here's the multicam clip so when you open that up you get a lot of angles and stuff but now I know that all of this is in sync so I just copied all of this just like command A and just selected all that and then I put that in a new timeline because I knew that I wanted to sync everything manually to the audio uh, and bear with me this is just to tell you how I problem solve sometimes so I pasted that into this and then I just put the audio in here and then all I needed to do was to find like two syncing points and one of them was was over here as his coming out he's going out of the car so I try to find like a, a noise that is easy to uh, to sync to so let's uh, let me just play so what I'm looking for is the door opening here and that looks like the roads are a little choppy back there okay so here you have it okay he opens it at that point I would then put a marker here so I would put a marker on this one and I would put a marker on, on this clip where that syncing point is and then I would just select everything uh, that is in this so everything from here to here and then I would just drag it to sync the marker points and that would be it and that, that's super quick to do and then I would do the same for this here you have the marker as well yeah. so that's how I would go about it if I would like manually sync anything and it's not a time-consuming thing for me so I don't worry about like syncing things or, or having audio in a certain way I just want it to be as few times that I need to do that as possible but usually it's just like letting things roll for a whole scene and then I know that I have just one syncing point to do it with because the time code in the cameras are fine now I know how to get the electrosonics to actually be time code proper time coded so there are gen lock to each other then that's super easy you just click a button and then you have everything and it's done so that's the way that you want to work but at this time I didn't figure that out but yeah you live and you learn uh, so I don't know how how are you syncing things because I just find uh, syncing with waveform super unreliable or unreliable and the reason for that is that I'm often far away from my subject I don't feel like I want I don't want to be connected to the person uh, that I'm shooting or I want to be connected but I don't want to be like closed just because of the audio I want to be able to take a wide shot and move away and go in and then that syncing process is tedious so this is a much more fluent way for me to work and I guess everybody has their process but this works really well for me and it's not at all time consuming besides like organizing the audio clips and like keeping that uh, in the right folders for the right scenes that's the thing that is like something you need to to do otherwise it can be like a lot of audio files and you don't know what goes where um, do you use proxies or do you have a supercomputer? I do, like I created proxies for this scene now, but I've been editing now with Blackmagic RAW and 
then I don't use proxies at all. So it comes down to what format are you using. For this I'm using the C300 material uh, and those are super slow. Uh, I don't know why it is or m I'm guessing it's because it's for audio channels or something like that. Uh, that makes it like so ridiculously heavy to, to edit. So that's why I'm using proxies for this, but with the Ursa or with the Blackmagic Pocket Cinema Camera 4K or anything like that, you don't have to use proxies. So it kind of depends on the format. Um, so shooting in ProRes or uh, Blackmagic RAW is much easier. But even now I've been editing like one or two layers, I think, with Cinema DNG and that's fine. But you need to have super fast drives, so SSDs or RAIDs. I have a big RAID, so that's uh, quicker actually than the SSDs that I have. Okay, so that was just like a quick showing of how I would go about syncing this. And then once that's done, I create a new uh, file from this, because this is the timeline that's just the synced one. I want to be able to go back to that uh, at any moment in time. So that one goes into the synced folder and if you want you have this template on uh, learn documentary the website but the scenes are where we're going so this is the one that i did the last time and this is the one that we're going to look at now so let's see what this scene is is pretty much scott who's one of the characters he's going to uh, take a soil sample and the reason that we're shooting this scene is is to kind of show Mining in a in a different way because the film is about mining, but not Like looking at the mining company that it's threatening the town But it's talking about mining without having them be a part of of the film. I think uh, because it's about the personal stories and how they're affected. So it's not at all about like this big, uh, like destructive mining company coming into town. It's more about like how does a mining company affect people living there. And Scott is like a small time uh, type of mining uh, person. And, and he's just going out and taking a soil sample and kind of explaining uh, what's going on in Kino. And that makes up for a scene that's more about like mining in general and also just showing what that is like firsthand. Um, yeah, and it, it's just a, a process of kind of figuring out what it's about at this stage. So let's just start looking at it and, and I'll show you because there's a couple of different things here. So first we have just him, this whole scene. You probably don't want to look in there, it's a little messy. <laughs> Which is going to be a, like a process of watching all of this and, and figuring out what the scene is. And then the other stuff is just <laughs> an, like an impromptu interview. Uh, and that's also just audio and video. So here it's just audio. Beautiful beyond words. Uh, and that's just like over here. No, not over here. Let me see. Somewhere else. Where do we have? Yeah, here's like interview stuff. Stabbing me in the back. I tend to, I guess, exercise. So because there's like two different things, I want to separate the two. So I want to take all the interviews and put that into one uh, timeline because that's going to be used for, for like several scenes, I'm guessing. And then I want to just focus on the action that's going on. So I want to separate the two. Uh, and some things are not like something that you should separate and other things are. So what I'm going to do for now is just like take out the, the interview part just so I can show you how I log an interview, uh, which is pretty straightforward. but. Let me just take this and copy this, make it into a soil sample, but interview soil sample. And then from this, I'm just going to cut everything that's not an interview out. Uh, and I know that it's starting around here, so that's going to go out. And this is going to be a really quick process, so I'll do this and then I'll show you how I log it. This valley is way in case close has to come down the slope. Oh, 
Might need to get a little bit of a run on that loose stuff, but... into Chris. <laughs> That gray stuff. So I'm just trying to Pretty remove everything. Anyway. So I can okay. just mute this. So I'm just trying to remove everything just so, so you can see how this is um, this is working. Now this is part of the scene. asking before like I'm not much of a miner really I just dabble I kind of like the thrill of looking uh, I'm not I couldn't give a, a rat to the duty if I ever found any amount of gold but I want to ask questions and exercise my mind and some muscle answer them it's a challenge you know you're trying to read the land and read the, the layers of how things have happened in the past that's what I find exciting is it's kind of my archaeology background, and uh, for small scale like hand like it ready and other leverage and forget it. Right. Now, why don't we just turn right here? Okay, that's it. Now I think there's a big jump. And you want to get down fairly deep to get undisturbed soil and you're looking for trace elements that have at the end of a small, about a one meter rod up and look at what glacial overburden look at this part of scene so I'll just well, let that be and kinds of crazy stuff but it's come in for who knows how long following the direction of uh, deposition and ice travel so you could be getting some really hot values but it could be coming from 50 clicks away so it's good to know when you're in glacial material. Yeah. The original surface is the, the slope cut bank back there. That sort of okay, all this is so specific to this, so I'll just uh, take that away. Okay, now it needs to save. Um, I do like having the auto save on, but it's a bit slow to save. Uh, but it's just for safety. <laughs> the live save though seems to be working really well. Uh, so I don't know if I'll keep using the auto save. I used to like it, but now it actually live saves, so it saves all the time if you want to, uh, which is the similar thing as Final Cut does. But this auto save can be so slow compared to the regular save. So I'm gonna tell you once it finishes, and you're gonna realize how slow it is because I'm still talking. It's at 20%, 21. Uh, it's annoying, but still safety first backups always be backing up uh, let me just get a question while we wait for it to save um, hey man you're doing an amazing job keeping up uh, requested to upload on how to create a DCP there is no complete process out there yeah I'm definitely gonna do that 70% um, what I used when I did Pearl of Africa was open DCP so I made the file photo jpeg I, I think or jpeg something like I don't know there's like a special format but opendcp.org or com I think it is is really like a simple straightforward tool to use but yeah now it's saved so now you know um, but it's uh, it's the one that we used and, and everything is free yeah, it's a bit tedious process because of that and it's super slow to do it especially on a feature but for us it worked out and it, we checked it in the theater before we went to festivals and then like it was amazing it looks so crisp so it's it's a good tool to be using but uh, i don't think there's a good guide so i probably need to make one for you um let's see then back to the screen so i'm just gonna jump to the talking here Could you just 
just tell me a little yeah, bit more. Yeah, I've always been Hey. Always be using JKL to be working the timeline. Yeah, I've always been interested in rocks. Oops, why did it do? Okay. Processes? <coughs> we're part of that, right? We just uh, were a little vain and think that our time scale is. So I'm just going <laughs> to speed this up just so you can see how I log it and then I'll go back to the scene. So generally what I would do uh, in a, a whole logging of an interview is to identify everything that's being talked about yeah. and the way I would do that is usually in a separate file and it doesn't work on timelines so just to show you I'll, I'll just like demonstrate the whole thing but I would make a compound clip or I would just do it on a clip that is an interview but for this it would probably be like you go through this whole process cutting everything out and getting it into like the the core interview just a rough cut of the interview pretty much and then from that you make a compound clip of it and then you can add uh, the keywords that I'm going to show you uh, because then you can see them if you just put them in a list view you can actually see everything like uh, yeah, it's easier to find everything and you can also drag like every subject or something but let me just show you and you, you'll understand so first step would be to just like select all this and create a new compound clip and then let's call it just interview test um, soil sample and that's it then we have that file and when you have that file you can open it uh, just like any viewer or something uh, let's get both of the viewers up so this is the viewer and now you have everything um, because when you do a, a, a timeline I don't think you can do this I think you're locked into opening the timeline because what you want is basically it to to appear up here and I don't think you can do that on anything else than like a clip or a compound clip so you would do that and then from that you can go in and you can just listen beautiful in, okay. beyond what words is, what is he saying uh, he's talking about Kino and heartwarmingly tragic that's the other part is where does a man go when he's got nothing left to lose. Um, they all seem to apply, but it's it's magic. If you can find a way to stomach all of that and thrive inside your heart, it's an amazing place to live. But yeah, it's not for the weak of heart, that's for sure. Okay, so all that is, is like him talking about Kino City. So now I would put in and outs, so I and O or these buttons over here. So I just pressed O on the endpoint. And then you would go in and you would right click and then convert in and out point to duration marker. And then I would double click on the marker and then you would say, okay, um, describing, describing kino city okay and then you would choose like a color for all of this so it would be like okay anything that is talking about kino is this or anything that's about the soil is this let's just uh, take the green one so you, you know and then like kino city or something like that whatever keywords you can imagine describing this can you see describing okay and then you have that and then you press done and then that's this part over here and the, the amazing thing now is that if you go into this you can go into a list view and you get that clip so you get it pretty much like instead of transcribing anything you instead go in and you you keyword things and you you do duration markers of things and then you can just drag that into things and you can search for it and all that it's so much easier to find things and figure things out so when you do that through all the interviews you can really start to piece things together and find all your favorite things uh, in category or whatever it is uh, and you can start coloring them in a certain color and stuff 
so let me just show you a different thing uh, so this one you can also just like go okay clip color uh, let's just select that one for green uh, and then when you would drag it in I would guess it would be that but it's not so I'm probably uh, yeah it is here we go if we zoom in <laughs> but you have to zoom in you see the green here let's go let's go no it's just a marker or did I choose the wrong color for this because everything is green let me choose one that's not the color no, it's not visible okay so forget about all I said about that I know that it does like color things because now it has like this green here which is the color of this marker so if you would change this to purple this should should be changing but uh, maybe you need to drag it down for it to change yeah now it changed you see here it's purple now I would think that they should do this more obviously uh, like in terms of the coloring because you can't really see it uh, but then another way that you could do this if you do it in a timeline instead of doing it here is to color the the clips so if we would just do the same thing in this uh, interview soil sample just go into that timeline and we would do pretty much the same thing I'll just do this to show you okay so this is the same and then you would do uh, the coloring of this just so it's easier for you to navigate it and then you would mark everything else that's like soil sample or something like that and just go about that way of organizing things but you would still like have an issue of finding stuff so i just prefer this way because you have the list way of viewing things because for this you could tag this but it's not going to be easy to find the thing so i prefer the first way of doing it um, but that means that you need to create a compound clip to be able to do anything um, with it okay so let's just go back and start looking at the scene um, but let me just see if we can answer some questions first um, let's see what is the unique feature of this software while is it a deal breaker i mean for me it's all about like how fluent the program is and how like how much is it in the way of what i want to do this program is not in the way of what i want to do and that's a personal thing as well but i'm grading a lot of stuff there's a big process of getting into Resolve, even if it's gotten a lot better. It's a big process to get from any program and it's not reliable at all. Not from Final Cut and not from Premiere. No program is easy to just like trust that it's going to work. Most of the time it does, but the few times that it doesn't, you're screwed. And that's not something that I can live with because it's it's just too dreadful and time consuming on like the short time frames that you have so i didn't just don't want to waste that time uh, and that was why i went to it in the first place now it's become so stable and good that it's much better in my opinion than the other ones just because i come from premiere i come from having used after effects and even like been a teacher in both premiere and after effects and I think that the programs are so much in the way just because it, it's a clunky system that, first of all, it crashes. This one crashes too. All software crashes. Um, but it's not as, as unreliable, I would say. It does have like certain bugs that I just don't understand why they, they don't remove them. But there's tons more in Premiere. And Premiere is, is much more like a better version. Every new version is a better version. This was like that before and now I feel like they got it fluent enough for me to be trusting it that it's going to work. Um, but the editing part of this has been around for a long time now, for many years. Uh, and now it's super stable. Fusion, I don't have enough experience to say if it's super stable or not. 
Fairlight has been the one that has been unstable the past couple of years uh, or since it was introduced. Now I feel like they've fixed that as well. So every new thing that they've added has had like some baby sicknesses. But everything has been removed within like the next release or something. So for me, it's always been about like which program is, is most effective for me to do my work. And this is the one just because you have just going from like one to the other. Okay, we're in the editing stage. Okay, we want to go into the coloring. Okay, click. We want to go into the uh, sound mixing. Okay, click. That's why it's so, uh, so good for me because it makes it much easier to go from one to the next and I'm not the type of person that like has um, normal online offlines I do have that for some client work and stuff but I usually go back once I've graded something I might change editing stuff and just having that uh, fluent way of doing that just going back and fixing it then I'm back in the coloring session that's what I love it so much for yeah, and then the organizing and, and just the powerful tools that you have for just structuring things is also something that I love about it. But it's not a perfect program. No program is. I worked with uh, Final Cut before I switched. And Final Cut was, for me, was great. It was just like perfect for everything until I made uh, a feature film in it and the program took like an hour to open the project once it became an hour so in the end it was just like the most dreadful project to be working with just because of that and i couldn't go back to it just because it's too unreliable but otherwise like i was so happy with it and, and the whole editing system so it just comes down to what type of projects do you do as well it's not just like this is the perfect program for everyone but for me it definitely is because i'm so into just doing like everything uh, and if you do that, then going from program to program is just time consuming. Um, yeah. And there is no unique feature. It's just like a, the best all around NLE, I would say. Like, if you work a long time in an NLE, there is no one tool that's going to be a deal breaker. It's the overall thing that's going to be the thing. Because like every program you have a razor blade and you cut things. Like every program does that the same. It's not a difference at all. It's just how are you handling everything else. And also which program handles your formats the best that you're shooting on. That's also a deal breaker. For me I shoot in like Cinema D&G and all that. Or I have. Now it's Blackmagic Raw. But that was like no brainer for me to to resolve because of that because if you want to shoot cinema dng none of the other programs work like final cut didn't even work with it it did not uh, even open them premiere was super unstable with cinema dng and that was a deal breaker then but now it's pretty much like i think most of them handle that but it's always going to be like limitations for every program uh, okay In Adobe Premiere, you have ripple, delete, left, ripple, delete, right. Very useful tool. I do too uh, use that one, but I have it mapped to F1 and F2. Uh, it's just like ripple start to playhead is what it's called. Best thing you need to add in the, in the, what's it called? Keyword mapping? Let me see. Keyboard customization. Because you need to add it because they don't have that shortcut built in. Ripple start to playhead. I think that's what it is. Yeah. Um, any idea when Blackmagic Raw will be on the pocket? I don't know, but they did an update now on the, the Ursa. And I was surprised now because I, I shoot this with two cameras. Ursa and uh, Blackmagic Cinema Camera MFT and the Ursa which is not live streaming is uh, before it was not possible to shoot without windowing the sensor and I need to double check this but I don't think the new firmware is windowing the sensor which is 
right so we're stepping forward i think that maybe next or the one after in terms of releases i don't know but i would guess because it's advanced so much and it feels stable mm. When is the, uh, the means Resolve going to put projects, files like Premiere Pro? Never. They're never going to do it. Um, I don't think it's hard at all to move project files. You just export the project file and you open it. It's super simple. We've been like doing this back and forth uh, with an editor that we've had. Uh, me sending the file, him sending the file. It's super simple. And there's like this, what's it called? There's like a... An edit feature, I, I'm not sure what it's called. I need to probably do a thing on this because there's this super smart thing which checks what changes is done and kind of fixes everything. I'll get back to you on that. But yeah, I don't think they'll ever become what that is. Uh, they just work with databases in a different way and DaVinci Resolve is made for big uh, production studios where you have a collaborative workflow it's not made for the individual even that's like where they're going also but the big thing with davinci resolve is that they have like big render farms and they have big uh, studios using it where they're collaborating on things so you if you're in the same network and i think now even beyond that you can collaborate on the same project and lock certain things within a project where you're logging a certain interview so nobody can change that but they can work on the rest and like that system is like it's made for professional editors uh, but and grader and colorist whatever um, but it's also available to you and that's the good thing um, do you shoot 235 natively sometimes I do to save space other times I just shoot 16 by 9 just because I can frame it a little bit but I usually don't. I usually just let it be. Sometimes it's comfortable though, especially when you shoot live like this, because I'm not sure what I'm doing in frame. Uh, just learn how to make custom LUT in OBS. Th is this something you do? Yeah. This is a custom LUT, right? Let me show you what it looks without and with. I think I could do that. Uh, should be this one. Oops. Nope. Filters. Without. With. Without. With. Yeah. It's a good feature. Do you feel there's any point in shooting RAW over ProRes 444 on the URSA if the final product is going to be heavily compressed after going on YouTube? If you're grading, uh, first of all, I always shoot ProRes 444 uh, on the URSA, but not now with the RAW format, the Blackmagic RAW. I always shoot Blackmagic RAW. Uh, and the reason for that is that it's smaller file sizes. You have all the flexibility of RAW, but you also have uh, like a reasonable file size. But they're also doing a lot of stuff in camera with that format. So I think it's a lot of the noise reduction and, and probably other things too. But a lot of the debayering of RAW is being done in camera. So it's as fluent as ProRes. So I would always, if I could, I would always shoot that. Uh, and this URSA setting is like 12 to 1, but I would not do that if it's not like a live stream. Um, but to save space, it's, it's a great format. Um, now, I don't think that you need the latitude of RAW versus ProRes 444. But it's super convenient to have raw because you can change the ISO setting, you can change the white balance. White balance is a big, big thing. If you expose something that's totally wrong in terms of color uh, and you need to fix that in post, having it wrong and having it permanent in the files, it just messes up the whole color grading. And sure, if you have latitude, you can solve it, but you always lose something by doing that. So being able to change that because it's raw, it's, it's a massive thing if you're grading something. Uh, that would be like the biggest reason for me. 
uh, and also it's better at saving highlights and just re-exposing things so if you want to for instance expose to the left or right you can choose choose that in post rather than uh, on the spot so you can choose in the middle and then you can s choose to save the highlights or the shadows or yeah both because you have all the information uh, yeah okay so let's get to the scene now uh, switch is which scenes soil sample so this whole scene what you need to kind of start thinking about when you're editing a scene is is what is it about and what's the intent because that's going to help you to figure things out quicker and to throw stuff away that you don't need this is just the start of the scene and i just like him outside his home so i'm gonna keep this but i doubt that the scene will start here this might be something that we use for another scene Why am I not hearing anything? Resolve audio. Uh -huh. To Chris. Seemingly tried. Okay. That's weird. Oh, maybe it's because it's stereo and it's actually mono. Got the shovel, the pick. I just got to grab a trowel and we should be set to roll. So... I just have a feeling that if I would start this scene, now I've watched this material a little bit, I would start it perhaps a bit into it. So what he's doing is he's going to take the soil sample and like I'm just a fan of, of getting into the action straight away and getting people interested and starting to ask questions like what's going on. So if he's walking back to his home and he's like setting things up, in a way I feel like that's just transport. It's, it's not really getting to what the scene is about. So in a way it's just wasting time. It's pretty much too early actually to say that, but I think that that's like my intuition at least, that this is just like something that might be worthwhile for something else. Uh, for like a different scene or whatever but not for this so my guess is instead of starting at his home and then like him going into the car and then going out there I would probably start here instead here let me see here we go just him throwing rocks because then you're starting to wonder like what the mm. f is he doing who is that dude and what's up this for instance is perfect because that's just straight up weird mm. Should be okay. I only have two wheel drive and I'm kind of low. <laughs> like that, I love those type of things where you just like him commenting on something that like it's giving you a sort of clues into like what he's doing because he's about to drive up like a steep hill and he might break the car and all that. And you just want to build up that tension and you want to build up 
at least like as much as you can build up the character and try to to show as much of that it, through the action so i think that if you want to get people interested it's really important to get them into the scene and action straight away so instead of having like him packing his car and doing that i think this makes for like a more interesting start of the scene but let me just try to piece this together and i'll just throw that stuff out as well um yeah you can see me there as well while i do this uh, i don't know if you wanted to but i will just do that okay i'll keep this just in case but all this I, i'm not gonna commit to all this yet so let me just take that out and i usually just put it in the end and then i figure this out either i delete it in the end but you don't want to go about deleting things too early uh, you want to see if you want to use it and i think this rock here is a perfect place to start for the camera shakes okay and then I'll just do that and all that oops Okay, I only have two wheel drive and I'm kind of low. Okay, and this I think goes better after, so move those. Because you want to build things up, you want to build it bigger than, than like having it uh, chronologically. So, what, what I'm going for most of the time is just like trying to build this up into a scene and not just have cuts. So usually uh, you can see people just do things really like uh, B-roll driven, which is just shooting things that are like, okay, this shot and this shot and this shot. But what you really want to do is build stuff into a scene where things are flowing and is like a narrative that, that's telling something in itself. And the way you would do that is break things up and try to like, look at what's going on in terms of the action. How are you trying to get the scene to progress? Uh, and that means that you need to switch like back and forth and all that and, and try to build that tension up and try to give clues and, and build it up. But I'll just keep continuing on this. I only have two wheel drive and I'm kind of low. before or after you edit always after because it slows down the editing uh, if you color grade before um, no you never do that and it just has to do with the, the online and offline the thinking of things uh, you usually have uh, for any project you have an offline which is like the editing process there you have like low res files this is uh, proxy media so it's like half or third of the resolution that the clips are all you care about at the offline stage is how quick things are running because you want to be like working fluently you don't want things to be heavy and, and in the way of you 
trying to edit and, and get forward. So you don't do anything of that. You just do it plain edits and, and all that. Uh, and then once that's done, you have a pretty much sort of locked uh, cut. That's when you start to like fine cutting and all that. And it's not until everything is locked and done that you start color grading. Uh, that's the general process and it's designed with the sound mixing and all that but I do a lot of sound design as I edit though um, yeah but that I'm just gonna, good. yeah I'm just gonna put this <laughs> as much as I can into a scene but then you need to go back and you need to like really cut it into a scene mm. just go around him and also the reason why I'm not cutting this down too much now is because I don't know how the voiceover is gonna lay or what am I gonna do with this once it's actually cut so you want to have it as long as you can for now and then later decide on how to like make it tight and, and cut it into something that's actually like watchable I think we should be good might need to get a little bit of a run on that loose stuff but Yeah. Um, that, 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 that that's Belkino, which is part of one of Alexco's lead silver mines, and this here is Close's uh, placer operation going up the valley. Close is a long-established placer family in the district. Okay, so this is an interesting thing. Um, I don't know how much, you, like most of you probably know about, like a little bit about the film, but since the film is about mining, but it's not about mining, um, you want to have these things that are like pointing towards mining naturally in the scenes. And this part here, the, like this segment, it's pretty good because you have him just like pointing out the mining. Uh, so you just want to be saving those things as you go along um, and marking them up somehow. Uh, I'm just going to color code this so I know that this is something that I want to check out later and, and maybe keep. He's going to stay. And then maybe this one. We can try. Okay, and here you're going to see how like I usually shoot. Because there we have our car. We need to get that up. So usually, like, you need to be really waiting on things to happen when you do docks. So here it goes. Instead of just running where the action is, like, I could run into the car. But instead, like, you should also think about, like, when you should wait and when you shouldn't wait. This is one of those moments where I think you should wait and wait for things to happen. And just be staying where you are. Well, want to give it a go? Okay. So you just want to have that finished. Uh, him going in instead of like rushing it and then I think I just repositioned to get it going up yeah there we go 
<laughs> it's so funny how the car is all dented up. Okay, so just staying here and not doing audio is too loud. Wait for it. Yeah, so just staying here and waiting for him to just go before I move. That's just like feeling the scene out and, and having it just quit there and then yeah it's done okay so i shouldn't do it like that because then everything disappears oops okay so this is just like rough cutting everything down um it, this takes a while to do but it's just a way also to to be watching the material and going through everything so it can be like time consuming to like narrow this down but it all comes down to like watching everything and then like tagging stuff that you like and then you try to piece stuff together and like doing docs and editing docs is a time consuming process like my process is usually a year or so of like editing and it's not a year in terms of like workload but that's the time of a process that I go through uh, and it's just because it, it kind of marinates while you don't edit and, and things grow and you get like inspiration and you get like ideas just by being away and coming back and, and that's how it works uh, yeah but let me just take some more questions here Gary Lane, thank you for the super chat. Sorry I'm late to the party. I had to watch Mars Inside Land on Mars. My Blackmagic Pocket Cinema 4K just arrived. Wanted to say thanks for everything you do. Awesome, Gary. How are you rigging that one up? Ah, I th showed this b before, but this is how I have it right now. I have a mini XLR. I am getting the cable for the Ronin to power this one tomorrow so that's gonna be when everything should fall into place I was able to balance this one and I actually know that I said that the 10 millimeters SLR lens was vignetting it's not I don't know what I did because it was but it was just me that the problem was me but I'm using this with like the tentacle sync device here goes into the line input to get time code with the electrosonics recorders that I have and then an ICANN VL35 for the, the screen and then yeah I made like a monitor thing here combining like small rig and, and yeah a lot of accessories clamp for the HDMI, uh, eight sin half cage. I want the tilt the cage though with the handle. Looks so much better. Yeah, but this is, it's pretty much my rig for now. Uh, so I shot a whole commercial on this one this weekend. I left the Ursa home because I was so confident in it. Used it on the easy rig. I didn't even use the Ronin. So it was super interesting to see how it held up. This screen needs a viewfinder though, because it's a bit, uh, yeah, it's a bit uh, problematic in bright conditions. But so far, so good. Imagine how light it is. I would just put it on my harness with this one. Epic. Um, let's see, I purchased DaVinci Resolve class from him and it's a refreshing and useful. Yeah, I'm gonna do a, an editing one later on, but for now it's just color grading. Um, you shoot this on a Blackmagic Pocket Cinema 4K? No, but the intro was shot on that one. Yeah, Ursa? You're not seeing the Ursa, but that one, Blackmagic Cinema Camera MFT. Can you tell us something about the way you direct the characters in your documentaries? To what extent do you tell them what to do? I pretty much don't tell them what to do. Um, I try to like direct as much as I can before we shoot. So it mostly comes down to directing what scenes are we going to capture. And then I just try to let it go. Uh, and then it comes down to you as a DOP or you as a, a director to get the right perspective of the scenes so 
for most of the stuff it comes down to like casting the right people that's one part of the direction so when you have that process of casting the people then that's when you have a chance to get everything as natural as you can in terms of like what scenes can you create with these people so for me the casting process is, is everything that's most of what i do as a director um, second step is to uh, go through that whole casting process do like a deep analysis and interviews like pre-interviews um, and then from that I piece together scenes and then I sit down with the people and I ask them like can we do this when can we do that uh, that type of thing they say we can't do that we can do that and then from that you piece together like a schedule where you're shooting things but you have an idea where you want to shoot certain scenes so for this for instance we knew that we wanted him uh, to be mining. Now this is just taking a soil sample. So the first thing we wanted to do was to go to his place where he's mining. We couldn't go there because it was like two crappy roads and, and it was just like a big hassle to get there. What we could do was getting a soil sample. So we had to like adapt to that. And then once that happens, I just follow along. Uh, I shot like the first part I think until where we are now and then in the car and then I think Maddie shot the rest from here when we get out so the stuff that you haven't seen all of this is shot by Maddie uh, and when when that switches here is just me shooting it because I was driving with him in the car because it's more it's simpler for me because it was just two seats so either Maddie would have to go and then he would have to direct while he's doing that and uh, that's not an ideal situation so instead I was the one that shot in the the car and then also I had to shoot when he got out of the car because it happens in a in like a split second he gets out and he does all this stuff so uh, for that it was just like a practical reason but then after that it kind of switches when Maddie is is shooting so then I'm more uh, let me show you I'm more of the person that he's talking to like he's talking to me as well when I'm in the car but it becomes like a little bit different in this part of the scenes yeah here he's looking at me so I'll just show you And here um, I know that I want him looking that direction so I actually position myself up in the bushes and up here and that's a part of a directing choice because I want him to be looking that direction up towards me rather than be looking uh, you know to the side of me or something because uh, I wanted to have more of the light in his face and that sort of thing so it comes down to making those decisions as well and that I do um, trying to like get his eyes in the right direction and, and just doing really subtle things but other than that it just comes down to trying to push him or nudge him in a direction um, but most of the time it's just getting the scene to start and then it's just collecting the images and, and getting everything to, to be uh, working I think I didn't show you those clips, so let me show you again. Here he is. Uh, this is Maddie shooting. Weathered chunks of bedrock sitting pretty and much where they've broken up. Towards me over here. And this one. This is a nice one for us. Get out of the hole, and then they can see how it compares to the real world that they're set up like. And I'm over here in the bushes so it's just me climbing up a bit just to get his get eyes in a certain direction yeah i hope that explains it i'm not sure um let's see what are you asking here what do you have on your rig yeah it said that let's see what else you're probably going with a tilt a cage definitely because it's so freaking good with a focus wheel as well that's a big thing uh, I wish I could afford a Blackmagic Pocket Cinema 4K save to it or buy the old pocket because the old pocket is amazing as well 
Uh, Gary is talking about Netflix has approved list of cameras uh, for narrative stuff. They do like like their original films to be that, but I think documentaries get away with pretty much anything. Uh, so you can you can always like you can always do your film and, and claim uh, artistic uh, something. I don't know what it's called. They asked me about it about my black levels. And I said that that was intent, and then they passed it. Because, like, the automatic scans that they do, they might reject your film. But if you say that, it, no, it's a creative choice, then you're fine. Um, okay, so, scene, back to the scene. So he drives away. I don't think this stuff here is so interesting, but I think when he gets out of the car. Okay, this is actually us in the car, so that's not at all interesting. This part. Watch me roll back into Chris. <laughs> I, I burned out my emergency there. I forgot I had it on when I was going up the hill. It's pretty much toast anyway. Okay, away we go. I think it looks pretty good, eh? shall see. Just don't, don't want to have to change a tire for tomorrow, that's all. Doink, doink, doink. Not very happy with this DOP here. What am I doing? Why am I... N oh, maybe it's because I have the easy rig on me or something. Cause it, no, it, maybe the microphone. I don't even know. Why am I so... Um, so unfocused on the ground. This is okay though. But no, what you're asking before, like I'm not much of a miner really, I just dabble. I we shall see. I just don't don't want to have to change a tire for tomorrow, that's all. But no, what you're asking before, like I'm not much of a miner really, I just dabble. I kind of like the thrill of looking. Uh, I'm not, I couldn't give a, a rat to patootie if I ever found any amount of gold, but I want to ask questions and exercise my mind and some muscle answering them. It's a challenge, you know? You're trying to read the land and read the, the layers of how things have happened in the past. That's what I find exciting. It's, it's kind of my archaeology background. And uh, for small scale, like hand mining, it's a great activity. And I've invested a lot of effort and resources into it, and I love it. You know, you, you have to work hard. Mm, most of this is not so interesting, I think. Challenge, you know. You're trying to read the land and read the, the layers of how things have happened in the past. That's, that's what I find exciting. It's, it's kind of my archaeology background. It's just the start of it that's, to me, interesting at least. A rat to patootie if I gold, but I want to ask questions and exercise my mind and some muscle answer them. I'll just cut that out. They all like hand mining. It's a great activity. Work is kind of like they say, it's best reward. Now, why don't... Okay, and then we have the stuff. Like they say, it's best reward. Now, why don't we just turn right here and park because the profile I want is just behind us and it looks like the road's a little choppy back there. Okay, and then we cut on that movement and we just check so we get everything. We don't need that. Okay, and then we cut to that. Okay, so off. 
So mostly I'm looking for like, oops, now I deleted this again. So mostly I'm looking for movement of, of some kind in terms of like getting the flow in, and rhythm in the edit. So you would just go like, okay, this movement just as it's starting or like cut from movement to movement. That's uh, usually what works. Now we need to just go to this part. Here we go. Let's see how they cut with that much movement or if you need to have less. Okay, so that feels like a, it, it feels jumpy. So you probably need this much instead maybe. That could be enough. It looks like the roads are a little choppy back there. Still a bit jumpy. A little choppy back there. Choppy back there. That works. So uh, those things are like really fine details and I wouldn't do that normally now, but I just felt like it was a good example of like trying to get a cut to work. So let's just continue. Johnny, do you uh, mic the subjects or shotgun? I do both, but I mainly use the lab, which is the Electrosonics PDRs with the uh, Sanken Cos 11D. So that's this one. Uh, but then you have here you have a mic on the camera as well. A little choppy back there. And here you see me. If I would do this, like, I would have to make a decision if I want to use this clip, or if I want to remove myself, or if uh, I want to just show myself. That's something you don't need to decide on now, so you just keep it, but at some point you need to make that decision. Now I think I probably saw myself, so it could work to just go there as well. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, and then we go over here. Now I did the same thing again. There we go. Yeah. They sort of come through this valley from the big valley up beyond this range and spend a few days looking for moose and motor on. Down below town is a spot where the moose congregate a lot different times of the year and uh, motor on. So this is pretty important. Uh, the stuff in the beginning I don't care so much about but him talking about the moose is an important thing because he uh, he's actually mining in an area where he's just doing it for fun uh, and uh, he thinks it's funny and I don't think the other miners <laughs> think that it's funny but he's keeping or he's staked a claim where he wants the moose to, to be walking so that if people are mining on the side of, of his uh, staked claim the moose can at least have like a, a strip where they can walk and then he's playing around and trying to find gold there as well. But he's just having fun with it. And I think that's like, it says so much about him as a character. So you want to build those things up and make him into this like nature lover type of, of figure, um, which he is. But then to, to make him also like really intellectual. So I'm trying to get those things like um, extracted out of this. Down below town is a spot where the moose congregate a lot, different times of the year, and uh, they really get along well down there. This 
this is a good example i think if you if you look at this from like a dup standpoint this is what super important if you want to to create like authentic moments and and you want people to to do stuff that is like magic just waiting and being quiet is the biggest asset you have as a director as a dup so just look at like just his face and just his expression and just what he is like i don't know throwing out of himself in terms of aura in this when you watch uh, this this part you just wait and wait and wait See that little road going up on the other hillside there? Yep. That's where the core shack is where we were cutting core last fall. It's kind of nice up there. We can go. Okay. Yeah. yeah, we're just gonna do a short little walk. So it's really like those moments that create like genuine moments. Now this is not maybe an example that I would use, but that's the type of style that I really like, like trying to get those moments. So if you, you wanna like, try to get that out of somebody like looking at how you maybe are quiet and when you're quiet and when you're just waiting and when you're saying oh should we go is super important it's super important to just feel that out okay yeah yeah we're just we can go. okay yeah yeah we're just gonna do a short little walk here so i'm just looking for like a road cut like this that's got a little better exposure uh, that we can just quick clean off so that when uh, the crew starts next week we can go up and look at what glacial overburden looks like ends that sort of taper down into the ground um, good quality ore and the glacial overburden you know it's separating you from the bedrock so whatever you get in the glacial drift, you could get all kinds of crazy stuff, but it's come in for who knows how long following the direction of uh, deposition and ice travel. So you could be getting some really hot values, but it could be coming from 50 clicks away. So it's good to know when you're in glacial material. Yeah. Uh, I don't think I have any use for this, but yeah, I'll remove it. But some things you don't want to remove when it's this, because this might be something that you can use later on, uh, just because he's talking about the material and yeah. But I'll skip it for now. So uh, the slope cut bank back there, that sort of we're walking in a void where there used to be material that sort of curved down and hit down into here. So this is all probably disturbed stuff, but I want to get right over here. just explaining I want to remove that and make it as cinematic as you can so just by removing him explaining what he's doing and just letting him do it is what makes it cinematic it's like two little hands that the goal is next week just quick clean off so that when uh, the crew starts next week And there's bedrock, so this is kind of sweet. So we're just sort of on the, the lip of a little. Okay. Working, sir. It looks like an old. Um, so there's a lot of schist and schisty quartzites in here. So this could be a good little spot right here. Okay, so that's all we need. Like, don't overcomplicate things, because uh, we're trying to make like a personal story. So going into too much details of 
like what he's doing is not necessary it's just like going to the core of what's happening and then you can add like layers later but at this stage i don't want to be like too technical with things open like that so this could be a good little so this could be a good little spot right here spot right here we actually have a soil over the bedrock. So I just want to cut the face down so we can see it. Now this stuff has all kind of been redeposited because it's been slumping down. And these are just weathered chunks of bedrock sitting pretty much where they've broken up. Any tips on shooting with one camera only? Um, yeah, you need to be like super cautious with the places that you want to cut. So you should try to cut in your head. Uh, as much as you can because that really really helps uh, the more you can like practice editing your own stuff if you're a DUP for instance you learn how to edit more efficiently yeah, that's like good DUPs are, are great at that they, at documentary DUPs I would say to like reactionary be cutting like how long do you need of this situation when do you need to move the camera um, but it's super personal as well like depending on what paces you like in terms of a story and all those things so it can be very different from person to person and that's why you should work with a DUP that has the same type of uh, style as you're going for got something like this two blades twisting it compresses and pushes down and but this is a comparison so what I want to do is get the crew to auger right beside this so they can look at what they get out of the hole and they can see how it compares to the real world that they're set up like so this is a nice one for us it's not too deep it's I guess it's like a colluvial soil it's slope wash but it's local soil so when you've got slopes like this oftentimes if you get an indication of interest it's an indication of what came from up above plus we got that disturbance right there that trench so but this looks pretty good for a soil yeah, if I can find what I did with my trowel, I'm always losing that thing. It's probably under here. Ah, there it is. Orange always helps. Okay. You could oh, use that. Helps. I'm going to put it in the end for now, but I do not think that I will use it, but it's probably good to keep until I know for sure. Oops, what did I do? There we go. Like, usually I want to prolong this whole scene as long as you can in the like the first step because you don't know what the pace of the film is so I'm, I'm trying to just keep the, the scene going rather than doing it dialogue driven yeah So you can see a little bit of the layering. We're down into some kind of sterile, almost subsoil here.
soil here, fine things tend to move up in the soil. And same way that rocks will sort of move up because they got the surface area. But when they've done analysis of a lot of unglaciated profiles in the central Yukon, this area has been glaciated, they find the sweet spot is often right in about here. And it's an indication of what might have moved down slope or come up from down below. So that one's good. And I forgot to bring the flag and tape, but I, I know where this is, so be easy to come back to. So this is something that I think I'll keep because I'm thinking that the glacier story that he's talking about, it might be something that's uh, usable when we start to talk of uh, the nature and, and um, for instance how the pollution is uh, being um, spread and all those things. So I'll keep it but I might cut it out. Might do 30 or 30 odd samples a day just roaming. Just tell me a little yeah, bit more I've always been you. interested in rocks, minerals, but earth processes, we're part of that, right? We just, uh, we're a little vain and think that our time scale is the all. This is good. We just, uh, we just, uh, we're a little vain and think that our time scale is the all important one. It's not. It's like Shakespeare said something about, you know, one little inconsequential drop of sand. So the geological time scale, it, it, it's really humbling. It gives me hope for our future, if that makes any sense. That maybe it will undo some of the things that we've been doing. I'd like to see us learn to be more generous with our surroundings and take the time and dilute the greed and put all of this stuff on the back burner and do something really innovative and start thinking collectively outside the box. How can we get less of what we need so we need less and do it in ways that are different from the long-standing technology of mining? We've got so many good examples, the Faro, Alexco. You know, I know they're trying to do good and we're trying to help them do good, but they seem to be blind to that. Hopefully they'll come around. But we don't have to keep repeating these mistakes of these multi-billion dollar cleanup formulas that are always on the collective burden of the nation. And at what immediate return? You know, it's not collectively advancing our lives, our welfare, and yet we're insatiable for it without even a thought of checking our own growth. Like, Okay, so this is the, the main conflict of the whole, whole story. So you have it. He's one side, and we're also following the opposite side that are pro pro mining. So, th what he's saying now is super important to kind of extract out of this because it, he's talking about it while he's in the scene. So, if you can get a scene working where you're following him uh, doing all this, and then you get to some point uh, that is moving the story forward, that's what you're trying to do. But you want it to come out of it being natural and following the action rather than just having like interviews. Like I hate interview driven docs. Um, it just makes no sense for me. It's just to me it's just lazy storytelling. And sure there's some films that are like the exception that are interview driven, but for the most part it's super boring. So you want to get it as natural as you can within the scene. And when you have a scene like this, where he's doing the soil sample and all that, and you're trying to like get it entertaining and, and interesting uh, as a scene and just by following him, and then you can put one line in or one thing in that is like driving the story forward and he's saying something. But instead of having just like one voice, that's what this will be. Uh, and that's what I'm trying to extract out of this. Like, what is the story going to be about? And I'm thinking that this is going to be what it's about, like him uh, talking about the soil or the nature or like connecting that into how uh, poisonous things is being spread in the environment, that type of thing. Uh, and then 
the other side will probably say that that's not such a big deal like having clean drinking water in uh, in a truck that drives it into town uh, which actually says drinking water it's pretty crazy um, that's not a negative thing they've never had as clean water as they have now uh, is their opinion of all of this while the water is like full of arsenic and all that so it's interesting to to like hear him talk about it here i don't think it will be this long but it's just like something that i know i will take from this uh, in the end and i'll just mark that out somehow now and then yeah i won't be able to finish this scene now in this session but yeah, i'll just show you how i would like what i pick out out of a scene our own growth like a cancer across the planet there'll be nothing left if we continue now we now have created our own geological era the anthro anthrosphere you know it's a layer of plastics and filth it shows up in the geological record that's pretty bad you know? uh, what was the idea of you or reasoning being higher on the hill and him looking up mainly is it usually when you shoot people and he's working down th it's super hard to get a good shot of him just being like pointing down so if i would be also lower he would probably have his head down all the time and and like by him just lifting it up you would get more of his face and, and just like a, an easier uh, face to compose and, and all that in terms of like the, the cinematography and i just think that it becomes more cinematic also when you have that and you can use the environment and the whole scope of, of everything because uh, it usually becomes also very dark when you're facing a wall which he is and you don't have any light so just by having his head up a little bit you get more of the sunlight as well and you get like better exposure and, and better um, yeah better looking face that was the idea behind it so not like a narrative one at all what do you think would would people pull that down? Okay, so let's just pick this in. Well, everything has been moving. You know, you look at bar charts, right, and you see peaks and things, but it's been climbing logarithmically since the Industrial Revolution. We've forgotten how to give of ourselves back to the planet. And we just take, take, take. And in North America, we have this terrible legacy that we're perpetuating with interest forward um, of, we believe that it's, you know, this unsatiable appetite can be fed forever without a, uh, a care for the consequences. We know it can't, but you turn a blind eye to it, and if you're on the receiving end of dividends, you are blind. And yet, we're co-opted into a consumer society where we're encouraged to consume more and more disposable crap that we don't need. We need to take some time. Industry, I mean, it has to be. Okay, I'll just keep this, but the, all this has to be shortened, but I'll keep it for now. Actually, take this. I'd like. Uh, do you use drone shots? Yeah, we, we shot a lot of drone but all those shots and all that that's uh, such a uh, like late thing that you put into a scene and a project uh, so i don't even look at them i did use them for the behind the scenes though but it's a later stage that you start putting them in <laughs> i'm just interested in like this is also something that you can take with you that like when I'm talking or whoever is interviewing or whatever it is that's when you're gonna get the best natural b-roll so just him right. here um, <laughs> I'm, uh, I'm just interested in, in like keynote just listening 
You usually get a lot of good stuff there. Oh yeah. <laughs> why, why do you think that is? I don't know. No, I have kind of when it, it's not stabbing me in the back, I tend to, I guess, exercise a bit of humor and. Okay, this um, I think is going to be more uh, part of the interview and not part of this scene. So I'll just try to skip. Setting cycle of optimism that comes in and refreshes when it's needed. So maybe it's just an ongoing dance, I don't know. Yeah, you talked about the uh, staking claims and, and all that, and w why did you start doing that? Uh, um, I, I don't... Well, the guy that asked me to do it, I like his style. He's a, uh, you know, he's a small scale, larger operator, and he does things in a good way. And he's a classy guy. Um, it's Plaser, but he's got a nice way of going on his iPad. Okay. There's two, right? Uh, there's one, 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 other spots. Why did you start doing that? Something about them. I was looking for a place where I could enjoy doing something that I wanted to do for a long time. Um, with minimal impact. So those areas, I spent a lot of time researching and then talking to other type of research. Okay, this is the stuff where he elaborates on the moose and that. So I'll keep that. So for drilling you need roads, unless you have a helicopter, like a special... And this is like talking about big time, big scale mining, so I'll keep that. Park there. I used to see them last winter on their, their runs. You know, they followed me around. They. They went right to the edge of my footprints everywhere I walked, but wouldn't go beyond. They were pretty cagey. <laughs> He's talking about, is it wolves or what is it? I think it's talking about wolves. <laughs> Make it up without falling down. Yeah. Okay, and then I think most of this is just B-roll stuff, right? So, now you promise you'll cut it out if I... Threads just, are up. just stand there and kind of look at it, stay there and just kind of look over there first. Don't, don't what, up there? Yeah, just look and you don't have to say anything, just look. Yeah. So as you can see, like the whole scene as it was, it played out this whole thing. And then we just asked him to do like some uh, B-roll uh, complimentary shots and it's basically just him doing the same thing again that's like the type of direction that we would do um, and he's just doing the same thing so it's nothing that's like unnatural or anything for him to do but we just focus on on getting the shots and not him uh, talking or, or anything so it's just getting the details uh, but it's always better to do it that way uh, than to uh, like break a scene and try to direct someone as it's happening. So if you want a certain type of look, you, it's better to do it that way. The ideal situation, which you could see if you look at the last session I did where we used two cameras, you don't need to do it if you have two cameras. You don't need to, to direct that way. So I'm thinking that for the next time that we go there, we would work the same way as we did the last scene that I uh, I edited where we had like two cameras because um, we got all the, the stuff that we needed to make it look as cinematic as we want because uh, if you're going for like this uh, big uh, uh, like this big Hollywood type of film style or like the big Netflix films or whatever it is if that's what you're going for having like a perfect cinematography is is crucial and if you don't have two cameras or if you don't direct people to actually do things uh, for you to get the right shots then you won't get it now most of the time when i'm alone i just shoot it and i don't really direct like that they have to do everything all over but when i know that it's something that's super important i would always do it so it depends on the situation i don't do it for every scene and it's not something that's systematic it's just something that when you feel you don't have enough stuff of this thing that you're trying to tell then you have to do that because you need to tell the story in the best way uh, yeah so these are just b-roll stuff so let's just go through them
<laughs> Maybe you want to see the screen, who knows? I would always check them out. Other editors would always keep them in. <laughs> Oops, what went out of sync there? Ah, doesn't matter. So I'm just using a J, K and L and then I'm using like split clip which I have at F3 and then I have like a ripple start to play head on F1 and ripple start to, I don't know, play end or something, I don't know what it is, uh, on F2 and those are the keys that I'm using and space and I'm doing everything with those. Oh, what is it? Same way. Do you only spot that safe to walk? Yeah, further down here, there's some really nice, just cut bank of just glacial cobbles, glacial cobbles and stuff. But I don't know what it's like at the bottom of the hill. Yeah. On that side last year. <laughs> The last glaciation, which would be the McConnell, or if that's ongoing. That's yeah. It's too bad. Like I don't know the condition. Okay, and then we're just walking back, and I probably want to keep that. That's about it. Then I think we have this whole scene. Um, now, I'm not going to cut it now, but this is what my process would be, like the, <coughs> the first step to narrow <coughs> Sorry, all this down, <laughs> is to like get all the stuff that you don't need out of this. Um, let's see if we can just get everything together. 
Uh, yeah, I'll be home. Signpost, but I haven't driven it since last. Okay, useless. Okay, here we have him just getting into the car, and that's the last thing that's. Oops, <clears throat> part of this scene. And then I would say the next scene starts. So this is what we would have from this. Uh, and this is probably part of an interview anyway. So in total, 23 minutes. And then this is going to be cut down. And I would say that it's probably going to end up around like five minutes or so. Um, but that's just how I would go through it and just narrow things down. And then you need to start to structure it. And, and that's the next step. But let me see if I have some more questions to answer before I call this a night. Uh, really good channel. What mic do you use? Uh, Sanken Cos 11D. <coughs> I usually mix in DaVinci for most stuff, but when we do it uh, in different places, like if somebody else does it, then we do it in whatever they use, which is most of the time Pro Tools. Uh, but for the most part, we just mix it in uh, DaVinci because we don't do. Uh, too many of those types of productions it's usually like everything is so heavy dependent on the sound design while you edit so most of the time it just makes sense to just do everything in in davinci because it's yeah, it's just the process of getting everything out and they need to relayer everything and it's just time consuming um, okay i want to know if you prefer the new pocket over the original absolutely it's the perfect one for me um, more on that later using color to help tell the story Gary Lane asked that previously I think I'm super fond of color grading and, and working with that as an element but I'm not so fond of the whole like color theory and working with like certain colors to convey a mood or stuff like that I think that's a bit overrated and I think that uh, it just becomes uh, like something that is like subtext floating around it just becomes so obvious like if you do everything in red it's supposed to communicate what love or danger or whatever it is those things I don't think work people are too smart for that um, but I think that they have a value in terms of moods and stuff so if you're trying to convey a certain mood, but I don't think you should look at it so literally what they mean, because all the colors mean something. And I think most people don't understand that, so they don't even feel it. Um, yeah, that's at least my thoughts on it. Mm, why do you prefer DaVinci over Premiere or Final Cut? I think I talked about that, but for me it's more about like, it's more fluid for me because I, I find that system better working for how I work totally dependent on what you do if you're not into heavy grading DaVinci might not be the perfect tool but today I feel like it is if you are a professional filmmaker and you are advanced I don't see the point of using the other tools at all if you if you know the other tools that might be a reason but if you're trying to pick one and learn one, then this would be the one that I would learn. Yeah. Um, what does DaVinci do that Premiere doesn't? Uh, Color-wise. Like everything. You can't even compare the, the coloring tools uh, between the two. Um, it, it's just an NLE that does color grading. That's what Premiere is that's not the same like you have color wheels and it's an effect it's not the same as having a dedicated tool to color grade like the advanced layers of color grading that you can do in DaVinci and the like small details you can affect really easily it doesn't compare it's like having Photoshop compared to you know not having Photoshop having paint that's how I would <laughs> say it is but I mean 
If you use Lightroom, for instance, that's so focused around making it quick for photographers to, to do stuff. So they rarely want to use Photoshop if they're not into retouching, for instance. So I would always prefer Lightroom, for instance, over Photoshop in terms of working with images, just because it's quicker. When you work with, uh, with uh, Resolve, it's kind of similar. It's like working with Lightroom uh, compared to working with After Effects which is so complicated to do a simple task as color grading. But the dedicated tool that you have in DaVinci is more focused around just making it to be the best color grading tool. Most people don't understand it until they work with DaVinci or any other color grading tool, but it, it's just like totally different on a totally different level. Uh, yeah. Why did you start uh, working in DaVinci in the first place. Mainly it was because Final Cut screwed up my whole last film because it took an hour to open it, but it also was because I was already color grading in it. So I was already using it for ingesting, for instance, Cinema DNG material into Final Cut 10, and then I used it to color grade the project. So it was just simple for me to, to just switch once they got the NLE into it. Um, how to take two hours of an interview and cut it down to about 10 minutes kill your darlings now you need to think about like what the story is and what is the, the thread of the whole thing and cut all the other stuff out because it comes down to really like digesting the stuff into something that is a story and something that is uh, consistent in what's being talked about and everything so it's just filtering stuff out. It, it just takes a lot of time to do it. Um, yeah, at what phase do you add music and do you use temp music first? I usually want to avoid uh, adding music until I start doing like a rough cut. So the first stage is usually to just edit every scene and then from that start looking at it like, okay, how do these fit together? And then from that I start doing like a rough cut. And then I start to play around with moods and everything. And I probably put like drones in at this stage as well and everything. But uh, I want to avoid music as much as I can to let the scene speak for themselves. Uh, usually I work with mood music or sound design rather than music. Uh, and then I use temp music, of course, most of the time. But for Pearl of Africa, I think I composed a lot too. Uh, w live with the Ableton Push as I was editing. So I, w I was working in Final Cut at the moment. So I was having Final Cut open, pressed play, and then I was composing the music to the the stuff that I was like had edited. So I was just seeing it live and composing the music, which was kind of nice. I'll probably do that again, I think. Uh, yeah, that's going to be it for this time. So let me know, comment, what do you think? about these editing sessions. This was really unprepared, uh, unfortunately, but it uh, still worked out pretty well, I think. I'm happy I did it. I got a little bit further with the project. So thanks for watching, guys, and I'll see you guys around. Bye-bye.